we don't have a set of rules? I know we'll accept the Codex Alimentarius rules. And all the members of the WTO worldwide will, get ready for an Orwellian term, harmonize with our standards, with the Codex standards. Harmonize. I suggest you capitalize the first four letters in your mind. So everybody's supposed to harmonize with Codex. And when they harmonize with Codex, then if they get pulled into the World Trade Organization dispute resolution process, they have a chance of winning. Because, here's the kicker. You ready for this one? If two countries go into the World Trade Organization dispute resolution process, and one of them is Codex compliant, and one of them is not Codex compliant, the one that is Codex compliant automatically wins regardless of the merit of the case. People are using Codex compliance as a weapon in a much bigger economic battle. So, every country in the world is racing to do what? To become Codex compliant. So, in the United States, the situation is, okay, how do we become Codex compliant when we have laws that protect us? And you have to remember that Codex does not serve consumer well-being, does not serve health. It serves what I call the five bigs. Big Pharma, Big Chema, Big Biotechna, Big Agribiz, and Big Medica. Little you and little me are not served by Codex in the least. So before we go forward and talk about the rest of what has to happen, let's ask what Codex does. You probably all know about the vitamin and mineral guideline that was ratified on July 4th. You may not know that although it is said that Codex guidelines, regulations, and standards which have been ratified are voluntary, they are not voluntary. That is known as a lie. They are mandatory, but they are not fully mandatory until December 31st, 2009. They're sort of kind of a little bit mandatory now, and they're totally mandatory then. Okay, so what does Codex do? Why do I care enough about Codex to close my practice and stop treating patients who came to me from around the world to help them regain their health and be radiantly well with non-toxic means, which is a very satisfying thing to do. I love it. And it also provided me with an income. I, that was nice. Um, why am I concerned enough? Okay, let's talk about the vitamin and mineral guideline first. In 1994, here in the United States, DSHEA, the Dietary Supplements Health and Education Act, was passed, which classifies nutrients and herbs as foods. As foods, you can set no upper limit on them. You cannot set an upper limit on lettuce, lamb, or rutabagas. And similarly, you cannot set an upper limit on vitamin C, echinacea, ginkgo biloba, vitamin D. And Access to nutrients is freely given to us. We are allowed to have any nutrients we want because, and this is a very important point, under common law, anything not forbidden is permitted. Codex, on the other hand, is a Napoleonic Code law system. Under Napoleonic Code, anything not permitted is forbidden. That's called a positive list. So, vitamins and nutrient, minerals. In 1994, we passed a shea. Nutrients are foods. We can have as much of them as we want. It's our business. In 1994, Codex, with no notice here in this country whatsoever, declared nutrients, put on your intellectual seatbelts, declared nutrients to be toxins. They're poisons dangerous industrial poisons. As poisons, we have to be protected from them. How do you protect somebody from a poison? You use toxicology. 
you use a science called risk assessment. A quick primer on risk assessment. First you take the substance that's poisonous and you feed it to animals and you determine the dose that kills 50% of them. That's called the LD50. Okay? And you extrapolate what the LD50 for a human being might be. Then you go down to the other end of the dosage range and you start feeding itty bitty tiny bits of it to test animals. And you come up with the largest possible dose, the maximum permissible upper limit, that can be fed to an animal before a discernible impact is shown. Okay? No discernible impact. Then you divide that by 100. That's how they do it in risk assessment. And now you've got a safety margin. So you've got one one hundredth of the dose that can be given, the largest dose that can be given with no discernible impact. Okay? Nutrients under codex not only are limited to those nutrients on the positive list, and we anticipate there will be 18 of them, and they do not include CoQ10, glucosamine, chondroitin sulfate. They do include fluoride, which to my knowledge as a physician has absolutely no biological benefit whatsoever. But it does make people complacent. Fluoride was first used in the gulag because it was discovered that prisoners who were fed fluoridated water were complacent and you could do anything you wanted to them. They were easy to manage. So, you have 18 nutrients, you have itty bitty teeny weeny little bitty doses that are determined scientifically to have no effect on any human being. Now, in this country we have a problem. We have Deshay. We got to get rid of Deshay in order to harm Onais with Codex. That part of Codex, anyway. So how do we get rid of Deshay? We attack it legislatively, of course. And there are five, count them, five bills currently before Congress designed to overturn, gut, invalidate, and otherwise get rid of Deshay. Because once Deshay is gone, we can harmonize with a vitamin and mineral guideline. So what we're talking about is waking up one morning and being very surprised to find that high potency, therapeutically effective, clinically significant nutrients are now illegal in the way